Hi, my name is uh, Ram Devineni. I am the producer editor of a new documentary called Ginsburg's Karma about the life of Allen Ginsberg and the Beats in uh, India uh, in the early 60s. And I have uh, three of the remarkable people that were featured in the film and also helped advise and give basically a ton of references for me to make this movie happen. Um, so I'm gonna introduce, well, we'll start off with uh, Bob. And um, Bob, uh, Bob, of course, is one of the main protagonists in the movie. So why do you think um, Alan is America's first hippie? Huh. And uh, what, what did you, when did you first discover his work? And also, when did you first meet him? What were your impressions? Oh, gosh, Ron, you, you know, you, okay, I'll take up the rest of this entire convocation with the, this first answer. Gosh, I love it. You cut to the punchline. I don't know that anyone has ever said straight out, you know, Alan was America's first hippie. But, you know, it's certainly true. And the trip that he took to India is where that movement was, was really born. If you can call hippie a movement. I mean, if it's a movement, there's no leader if there's a movement it's a sort of like a shimmy shake kind of poetic leap of a movement um, but in india is where alan followed a spiritual path which is what india does you step foot on that land you're on a spiritual path because it's all around you the hinduism and the buddhism and the and 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 the all the different religions there um, as opposed to the drug use of, which is also part of the the, uh, the 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 hippie ethos, of course, you know. But it was in India where he also came face to face with a kind of global politics, believe it or not. Also in India, with when he, with the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis and and getting a letter from Bertrand Russell or writing a letter to him too. Um, it was uh, also in India where uh, the his life in a in in in, in poverty in a in, in Calcutta was the way that the hippies traveled from uh, hitchhike from place to place. I mean, it's you could go on and on, but um, I will go back to when I first ran into Alan, um, literary wise that is, because I was growing up a kid from Kentucky. All of a sudden, discovers in the early '60s that. Um, that poetry is not just the stuff that you read in books, which I loved, but it was a living art and that the beats were a voice of uh, the United States that I'd never heard before. And that was a voice of freedom and uh, liberation. And it, 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 you know, all of a sudden it looked like I could be a poet and there I was. So, and I followed Alan into New York. That is, I followed, you know, to, I went to Columbia where he went to school. And, uh, and I first met him when I moved downtown after graduation and went to a party and there was Alan washing the dishes and showing me what a life of service as a poet was gonna be. And we had uh, years of friendship and my best buddy became his secretary he was, uh, you know, he was a poet on the block, but he was a poet on the world. So I feel very, you know, personal relationship with him, with uh, with the, the other beats. Oh, you know, it's, it's a tiny town, the world of poetry. If anybody's watching this and you're a poet, well, I'm shaking your hand and and that's our poet's kiss and passport. So I'll, I'll, I'll cede the rest of my time to my compatriots. But if you want to know anything about Alan personally, like his phone number, um, just, uh, you know, e email me, bobholmanpoet at gmail.com. Thank you. Deborah, um, we are doing this interview with travel restrictions still in place in most parts of the world due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, one of the things that comes out in the film and more so in your book is Alan's love of traveling. Uh, what do you think he got out of traveling? And um, as a poet, of course, um, but also if Alan was alive, what do you think he would miss most resulting from this lockdown? Uh, well, I think he was really a genius at travel. 
Um, and he was not a person who had a carefully mapped itinerary um, before he, he left. Um, and that was very different from Gary Snyder, for example, when who he crossed paths with in India. Gary had it all mapped out where he wanted to go, what he wanted to see, who he wanted to talk to. But Alan was very spontaneous and he traveled and talked to anybody he met and fo followed their, them into their homes, into their places of worship, um, asked them questions, um, ate their food. And I think this was true in India as well as all the other parts of the world that he traveled in. And, um, and I really admire that. And I do feel that, you know, that so much of, um, you know, the wanderlust that, you know, people discovered in the late sixties and seventies um, in America, you know, the kind of budget travel, um, hostel, train, train buses, um, you know, the school bus that left, uh, London to, went through Afghanistan. I mean, all, all of that really came out of the paths that he laid down in, in India. Um, but, uh, so, but on the other hand, I also know that, you know, he, 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 on his window out of his apartment on the Lower East Side was also a place of wonder for him. You know, he took so many pictures of those you know, horrible weed trees and, you know, the fire escapes. So um, he could he could make a poem out of that too. So um, I'm sure COVID would find him, his mind as restless as ever. That is, that is true. I think there's a lot of photos we've taken of our apartments and of our rooftops and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Tony, and of course, you're... he had his great vision in his, you know, walk-up apartment at Columbia, looking out at the rooftops and the sky. Um, you know, it wasn't, he didn't have a great vision in India. Um, he had it at, at home. Well, that's a good segue into uh, the question for Tony. Uh, Tony, uh, you talk about Alan's uh, Blake vision in the film and how it influenced his work. Um, it's part of Alan's lore. Um, I mean, it's basically mythologized right now. Do you think Alan was aware of his role in history? And um, how do you think he helped to mythologize himself? I think he was aware, absolutely aware of his role in history. And one of the things that I'm, 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 real, I'm, I'm always drawn to in his life and work is this remarkable ability he had to balance what was, as poets, we call it po-biz, like showbiz, you know, he, this ability to balance po-biz with a deep visionary consciousness and, you know, a belief that there is something beyond the five, you know, the poet's job is to work within the five senses and also summon something from beyond the five senses, which isn't always going to be the um, isn't always going to be the, a, a great vehicle within Pobiz, and he was able to balance both of those. And I think um, that's part of. Um, I think that's sort of like is 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 just you know part of the mythologizing energy or mythologizing impulse. Like he um, he had such a great mind to know um, when he needed to function as a kind of PR person for fellow beat writers and a great mind to know when, oh, now I need to talk, in this interview, I need to talk about the Blake vision because we're talking vision now, we're talking prophecy, uh, we're talking inspiration. Um, kind of like I'm thinking about what Bob was saying about Alan as being a poet in the block, a poet on the block and a poet in the larger world too. Like his ability to be in both of those worlds was, was just amazing. And so I think that was part of the mythologizing, um, you know, and, and how he was able to, to, it, was, it was part of how he was able to, to um, self-mythologize without um, losing artistic integrity, you know, actually deepening his artistic integrity. Um, and, you know, part of mythologizing when I think of the Blake vision too is like, you know, he talks about it in the Paris Review interview. <laughs> so it's like this, this prestigious venue where he talks about this, uh, this vision this, that, you know, some might call an auditory hallucination, others might call, you know, the real thing. Um, 
he just puts it out there on the table, but he puts it out there in a, a venue that's just sort of like a very high premier place of status in Pope is. And I think he knew that and was aware of that. And, um, you know, I also think of in terms of mythologizing, I think of the way uh, the energy and the substance he put into um, starting the Kerouac School, helping to start the Kerouac School at Naropa, you know, that required a pragmatic Pope's sensibility and, um, and also the way they set up the curriculum, it required a true, a real belief in the visionary potential of art that I think was part of the Blake vision for him too. So uh, yeah, I think the vision was, is a really good leaping off place to start to think about that kind of mythologizing and how he was able to combine the dedication to art making with an understanding that, you know, the poet is a, is a self out in the world. And it, it, that's, you know, the, the poet has multiple selves, one that's out in the world in the Pope is terms and the other that is um, summoning for Ginsburg, you know, a prophetic lineage that goes back to Blake and beyond. So I'm gonna throw this question out to everyone. And uh, if, you, if you have an answer, that'd be great. Um, there's no doubt Alan is very representative of the second half of the 20th century. Um, and how, he, how is he and, and also his work important now? Um, it's, all, it's been almost 25 years since he passed away. And what can the younger generation of activists and social justice warriors uh, learn from him? And it can be expanded to other, other groups as well. Anyone who wants to take it on, please go ahead. I think one of the things that um, that I was a real revelation to me when I was doing research for my book on his was how sort of he would he would um, he would you know in his letters to his father he would talk about politics, um, but I don't feel that politics was much of a conversation for him with his friends. It was always you know poetry or drugs or something like that. But when he was in India and the war broke out in 1962 between India and China. And he saw that this deeply spiritual place could become just as warmongering as um, America. Um, and so then he began hanging out with these Gandhians who were decided to do this march from Delhi to Beijing. And it was a performance. And I think that impacted him deeply. He spent, you know, a couple of weeks, you know, sitting with them, walking with them, you know, sleeping with them. And, and he, and, and that I think was revelatory. So, mm -hmm. um, and he brought that kind of understanding of how politics and activism can be more than just marching and protesting and carrying banners. It can be a performance. And he was able to use his fame and notoriety, which, you know, Time Magazine couldn't get enough of him to, um, you know, bring attention to, you know, later uh, the war in Vietnam that was just, you know, he heating up when he passed through um, Hanoi on his way to Japan. So, um, so that, that was really, really a, a long term thing. And I think that we don't have often the same kinds of imagination you know, because, you know, to do just the same protests, the same slogans over and over again, you know, which is why, you know, you can have half a million people show up for an anti-war march and it's a one day news event or, or not an event at all. Um, so he, you know, if we could just have people that have that more kind of understanding of how spectacle and the press works, you know, that that would be, that would really do a lot for, for um, you know, pushing pushing you know the envelope on politics these days. Yeah, we miss Alan. You know, he was the voice of the poet, the voice of truth, the and the voice of the street. Uh, but he wasn't just talking. He was also doing extraordinary research. He was in touch with everybody. This is why I think it would fit well with the digital age. You know, he really did deep dives into what was going on with the CIA and able to turn that information into, into, uh, into song, into, into, into lyric that, that people could, who bomb? You know, he, he, he was, uh, was as, as 
as Deborah says, he was able to take that news and turn it into an art that would that would in, that would in, inform and be accessible to all. And we really miss that voice right now. You know, we have plenty of people talking about issues, but nobody has taken nobody has been able to figure out a way to get that public persona. So that's yeah. that's that's one thing that he uh, that, that that Alan was able to to do. And just the idea of flower power. You know, that comes entirely from, you know, you know, marigolds and 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 levitating the Pentagon and, you know, just, you know, merging this sort of spiritual idiom um, with with love and um, and, you know, uh, press the press. <laughs> love and the press. Love, love and the press. press, getting love. the attention of the media and keeping them spellbound. And I think and using the oh, and sort of using that mythologizing sensibility for action. Yeah. And like like you were saying, Deborah, he was more than just I mean, he's marching. He was a, he was a, a person of political action. But as you were saying, more than just marching in the streets. And I think that's part of the legacy that he can give to uh, a younger generation of, of activists in the 21st century. And 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 it's it's that combination of of my, critical mind and imagination and action. And I think, you know, there was, when you really look at his body of work and who he was, it seems one consistent thread is like his belief that the imagination in and of itself was subversive. And wow, I mean, that's like, uh, it's not just using your imagination to increase the profits of an oil corporation by 1% or something, you know, it's like using your imagination to change the world. And um, that I think is, is, is a great, it's a great legacy of his. And it's sort of like what Bob was saying too about, I was thinking of this when, when you asked the question, what, what Alan, like his research, for instance, on the CIA, like what he was saying about CIA drug running at one point, like in the early to mid seventies, was laughed at as conspiracy, conspiracy, you know, mongering. Well, then it turns out to be true. <laughs> and so the guy that had this gigantic file of news clippings and, you know, could just rattle off the facts and figures from his research that wasn't really being paid attention to, oh, he was right. <laughs> and so, you know, I kind of think that, that that sort of ability to obsessively and I mean obsessive in a good way, you know, obsessively draw on the subversive power of the imagination to try to change the world. Um, that's invaluable. And I think that can be a role model in, for where we are now, no matter what age you are, but especially I think for younger generations of activists. I want to tell a little story. <laughs> I was with Alan in 1986 in Nicaragua. We had a, a group called U.S. Poets Invade Nicaragua. We went down for the Ruben Dario Festival. Joy Harjo was there. I could go down the list. Pedro Pietri, Diane Burns. I mean, it was Alarista. It was quite a gathering, an amazing gathering. But while we were there, we were all, and of course the Sandinistas, this is what, you know, the drug running that Tony was talking about was how the, the CIA was running, um, you know, was, was getting guns down to the, to, to the to the government while they were bringing back drugs to the United States to to to, to stultify the the, the neighborhoods, um, so Alan was uh, we were primed to we were working in the coffee fields we were hanging out with Ernesto Cardinal and we loved the Nicaragua the Sandinistas who were teaching poetry workshops for prison wardens and for coffee workers prison uh, jail workers. Um, Alan was taking the government to task for the treatment of gay people. And we couldn't understand, Alan, come on, we were their guests. He had to teach us this lesson. We were a bunch of young poets on a toot, having a great time with a revolution that was working and had poetry at its heart. But for Alan, it was another teaching moment, another moment for us to understand that, uh, you know, the human rights are basic rights. And I, I would love him to be talking about this now on the, with, on the anniversary of George Floyd's death, which is today, we're taping it. And uh, because Alan would always bring up these issues in the most uncomfortable situations. 
And that's where poetry also does its work. You know, poetry is not a language of comfort, you know, although it can be very comforting. That's my story. India is going through a very terrible wave of COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, there's many funeral pyres burning almost continuously 24 hours. Um, what do you believe Alan learned from watching the bodies being cremated in the ghats? And how did those experiences, uh, what do you believe, how, how did they transform him? Well, I think what with the pandemic, you're saying that's something different. I mean, that's an, a whole other nightmare that these people are not people that died of COVID necessarily, they died from lack of treatment. And I, I don't, I, it's hard for me to relate the, you know, mass um, cremations that are going on now with what Alan experienced. Um, you know, basically I think Alan had a, probably a kind of overwhelming fear of death. And, and he knew that enough, he knew enough about himself to know that this was going to be an obstacle for him to get beyond that he needed to get beyond. And so going and spending time at the cremation gods, um, you know, demystifying uh, death in some way by watching, you know, for the hours and hours that it takes to for a, for a body to burn, hanging out with, you know, the sadhus and grieving families. I think it helped him you know, and, and also he learned that there were various spiritual practices, smadanas, I think they're called, which involve sort of immersing yourself in, in skulls and ashes and uh, cremation, uh, cre the cremation rituals. Um, so it just basically became kind of an everyday uh, thing for him, and it did end up, you know, liberating him, and and not just from his fear of death, but also his fear of dying alone. Um, he felt that, you know, his relationship with Peter was um, on was very fragile, and so he just had this horrible fear that he would be that he would never have a family, never, you know, have people to um, see him through that passage as an old as an old man and and death so um I think he just he just finally got rid of that and and that it started in Calcutta with his visits to the Nimtalagat and it continued in Benares where a lot of people go to Benares to die so you know he worked alongside um you know dying people he tried to care for them he wasn't frightened of the kinds of biological processes that you know they would go through in the course of dying so it was a really very tender thing and I think Peter also showed Peter Orlovsky um, showed him sort of a way of being there for people who were sort of struggling and dying um, because Peter had you know been a, a nurse had worked in as a sort of nurse's aide um, so I think that they did sort of have that time together in Benares that was very important to them in terms of working with the, the people who were dying there. Um, actually, Tony, that's a good, good segue from what Deborah talked about. Um, is there a spiritual awakening or reawakening that Alan experienced when he came back from India? And can you kind of explain that? Yeah, I would say it's a, a spiritual deepening. Um, and uh, uh, I think, um, um, a sort of, I think India helped give him a trajectory that we see through the 60s and into the 70s. Um, I shouldn't say helped give him, I should, it's actually more than just, it's, I'm making that sound so passive. I think India was the breakthrough that enabled him to construct that trajectory. Um, and I think mean, for me, when I think about it, I think about partial, like what, what you know, the, the breakthrough of India and the spiritual deepening, I think of the role of the body in his poems. It's always been huge and always important. Um, liberating the body and liberating bodily desire from, you know, repressive state systems and and you know just like giving, uh, uh, taking care of the body and 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 taking care of the body's pleasures was so important. In all of his poems leading up to the trip to India, of course. Uh, uh, but then I think, because of the Blake vision and the way that. Before India, he had been trying to recapture the Blake vision with drugs. And I know I talk about this in the film a bit. 
I think when he came back from India, there was an increased, a deepening emphasis on the body, but in a different kind of way, the body as something that is um, the vehicle for our spiritual practice. Um, you know, that you don't try to, you don't try to kill the ego, but you try to summon the ego as a vehicle to go to someplace uh, farther and deeper spiritually. Um, and I think throughout the 60s, this enabled him to be, a, the breakthrough in India enabled him to focus squarely on material political issues that you see in like the fall of America poems. And, but to do that without neglecting spirituality and without looking at spirituality as like, this transcendent thing that takes us out of a sick world. It's just like, no, this spiritual practice brings us closer. This is how we realize America is falling or, or has fallen. It's through this uh, uh, the spiritual path. And so I think it redirected his spirituality, deepened it. And, you know, in the late 60s, he's still kind of conflating Hinduism and Buddhism. Um, but I think that was more of a function, not of like, not not having a studious serious practice i think it was a function of just having the spiritual energy he did and not meeting not working with a teacher until he meets chogam trungpa rinpoche in, in uh, 1970 and takes bodhisattva vows in 72 and i think that's when the trajectory got maybe more for lack of a better word focused although i think it was always mm -hmm. focused but i think it was india where the breakthrough happened i don't think we could have Ginsburg meeting Trungpa and taking it as seriously in the same way if it hadn't been for India. You know, there's a lot of work that can be done in here. Once, uh, uh, once the the idea of Alan as the first hippie sort of crystallized itself, all of a sudden it opened up new paths. Deborah, you got more books to write now. Um, <laughs> This not making it into the film is a lunch that Ram and I had in Delhi with the Sado uh, group of poets. Um, and there we heard a story, we, we heard a poem written by, uh, about another poet, Trilokan, who went, uh, who, who Alan hung up with. When one of hundreds of poets in India that Alan would hang out with. Well, this guy was a, 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 a kind of sadhu poet and he taught some breathing instructions. And then they began to uh, run through the streets of New Delhi and through and, and laughing and playing, no drugs, right? We're doing, this is strictly mind work. Okay, and the poem, which is, it's about this guy, Trilokan, which means third eye. Alan's eye begins to open up. This is the poem I'm quoting now. This isn't me talking. The <laughs> third eye starts to open. The sweat is coming down. The reality is refracted, not through any kind of drugs, but through the sweat of life itself. And Alan had a vision. Tony, you got to get on the case. Another vision besides Besides the Blake vision happened right there in Delhi, only nobody knows about it. And we got to find that poem. And that moment where Alan was able to not have the drugs, but to have the, the uh, you know, this, this experience through Indian religions, you know, I mean, his, his, his path to Buddhism really is what, uh, the Beatles would not have gone to India if it weren't for Alan. Come on, so let's just put it out there. And, uh, and, and the starting of the Naropa Institute in the Jack Garouac School um, of, of this embodied poetics is because of, of Alan and Ann Waldman and Trungpa seeing how the religion and the poem weaves together. That's great, Bob. Do you, uh, I mean, you met the sadhus, Alan met the sadhus. And now that you're much older, um, since we started this film, do you want to watch much older, Ram? Come on. Well, old, old enough to same, don't I? old enough to wander like a sadhu poet. Do you want to yeah, wander? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. It's just no, no, it, do you want to do you want to wander the earth like a sadhu poet? Is that what the goal is for now? Well, I have found a teacher now, and that uh, you know, but that makes me want to. Uh, to sit more and look at the wall. 
<laughs> you know, you can see a lot of stuff there. Well, so, yes and no, I guess, as usual. Or as Gregory Corso said, if you're a poet, when somebody offers you to take this thing or that thing, you always say, I'll take both of them. That's the poet's choice, both of them. Because Alan obviously died 24 years ago and it was the beginning of the internet and the new the internet age and email was just coming into being. I wonder if Alan ever used email and if he did, if anyone has the first emails that Alan Ginsberg ever sent would be actually, I think, quite valuable because, you know, most of his letters and his writings were all written like poems and the spontaneous thoughts, which, which um, you know, I, I kind of look back and I say, Alan was kind of a precursor to email because our language has kind of deteriorated to almost being these spontaneous little tidbits of poems in our emails to get our thoughts out. Obviously not as articulated as Alan was, but I, I'm kind of curious, what do you think Alan would have written if, it, if in the email age and, and being a researcher, I'm sure he would have loved Google. And I'm gonna throw this out to anyone and uh, see what your thoughts are on. And who, maybe Tony could even research and try to find those emails, those first emails, if Alan actually did said, write them. I mean, this has got, when, when, you, when you got to, when you turned the question that way, my first thought was, hey, hey y'all, I have to go. I wanna look for those emails. <laughs> uh, I mean, what I'm struck by, like first thing, the image that came to my mind was like, when you, his correspondence has that, you know, distinctive kind of wavy, bouncy, cursive script that we've all seen so many times in his correspondence. And it would be really bizarre to see an email from him and see it like in electronic pixels on the screen. Like it just, it wouldn't, said the pun is really bad, but it wouldn't compute for me in a way. But, but you know, I think, um, I think had he, had he lived further on into uh, uh, the technological age we're living in now, I think that he would have taken the, um, the intensive letter writing he did with postal mail. And I think he would have just transferred it to email. He would have been, he would have been your friend who always sends you really long emails and they would have been amazing emails. That's my thought. I have the little drawings and symbols and stuff that he would always include with his letters, it seems, you know. That, the tactileness of, you know, him giving you a little burst of, you know, creativity. I would miss that. Well, I mean, uh, Alan could have done uh, gifts back then. Gifts were very popular. I mean, they're popular now, but G-I-F-S. Yeah. Um, I, so I think he would have appreciated memes, like in the way that, like, when he starts performing with punk musicians, you know, in the, in the 70s and 80s, like, it turned on a whole... Um, generation was mostly mine into like, oh, he's, I'm into the stuff he likes and he's into the stuff I like. That's fantastic. And I think he would have been that way with memes too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah he was an early adopter. An early adopter. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the, here's a, an inscription from Alan. Yeah. Um, as you can see, he was quite in the details of really making you a gift, a GIFT. <laughs> Um, whenever he would give you a book, and uh, this 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 book holds uh, his his poem in my kitchen in New York, which I've, I've made a video with him of this. It's a poem of Alan going through his Tai Chi dance, his gestures, his Tai Chi movements in his kitchen, and it's his inner monologue. So uh, you know, as he's turning, he sees that picture of Rambo over the bathtub. Don't forget, guys, that bathtubs used to be in the kitchens in, 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 in the Lower East Side. Um, or uh, over there is uh, those stacks of bills to be paid, and over there are is my dirty laundry. You know, so it's a wonderful poem that actually works as a video because uh, you get to see the actual room where these thoughts are coming out, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, blah, blah, blah. But at any rate, it just, uh, you know, he was not averse to technology, let's put it that way. He liked working with, uh, with rock bands. He liked working with, uh, with video. Um, and Tape all recorded. I can say is a tweet from Alan. Can you imagine, Deborah? what would a tweet from Alan? Yeah, yeah he would be a, he would have millions and millions of followers. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Deborah, Tony, Bob, for this remarkable conversation and being a part of this journey for Ginsburg's Karma, which took us about 10 years to make and uh, generously supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities. It's going worldwide launch on uh, June 7th, and you can watch it for free um, when we launch it and appreciate it and uh, check out the link below. All the best and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Ram, and congratulations. Thanks, Thanks. Ram.